plantain, like it's just always helpful. It always helps with inflammation. It helps with many different kinds of infections, but obviously not all of them. And it's a vulnerary, it's a tissue healer. It really helps to heal the tissues. Hello, and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. In this conversation, I am joined by my dear friend and fellow herbalist, Jim McDonald. I met Jim over a decade ago at an herbal conference, and I instantly loved his wit, his wisdom, and his often hilarious herbal analogies. Over the following years, I would study with him every chance I got, sometimes even traveling long distances for weekend intensives. Jim is an energetic herbalist who's brilliant at getting to know the plants while also understanding tissue states in very practical ways. If that doesn't make sense to you yet, I think you'll get more of what I mean through this insightful conversation. For those of you who don't yet know Jim, in 1994, Jim McDonald's life changed when he drank tea from a wild plant he harvested from the land he lived upon. Since those first sips of strange tea, his life in the woods and meadows of Southeast Michigan has been centered on the plants and ecosystems of that land and how he might share their virtues to restore wellness with those around him. Jim's approach to herb craft is deeply rooted in the land he lives upon and blends traditional European folk influences with 19th century eclectic and physiomedical vitalism, which he conveys with story, experience, humor, common sense, and lore to his students, clients, random passers-by, and readers of his website, herbcraft.org. He's taught classes throughout North America and is currently alternately writing foundational herb craft and a Great Lakes Herbal and children's herbs books, in addition to articles for journals and other publications. Jim is a community herbalist, a manic wild crafter and medicine maker, and has been an ardent student of the most learned teachers of herb craft, the plants themselves. Welcome so much to the show, Jim. I'm so happy you're here. Hey, that's good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Well, I want to hear how your life was changed with that sip of tea that you (laughs) took one day a couple years ago. It was a few years ago. Yeah. Um, It's a funny story about that. It was, it was burdock, right? And I had a little trowel, maybe about that long. And I was like, oh, I read in, I read in my herb book about how good burdock was. And I started digging and I started digging and I started digging and digging and digging. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, you know, it was like, that deep and the roots still that big around and going down. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Um, there was a lot of soil displacement in that. And I took it inside and I I washed off the rest of the dirt and I chopped it up and I put it into tea and steeped it for, you know, until it was not too hot to drink. And then I was like, do I feel anything happening? (laughs) <laughs> and you know with burdock that you don't really get an immediate like strong you know like oh my gosh these things are happening i knew that this would be really good for me in all kinds of different ways and now retrospectively i think all the stuff that's happened ever since then is what happened from that one cup of tea hmm. do you remember if it was like a compelling taste or if you were like yeah or do you remember that at all i remember thinking it, it like it wasn't it wasn't bad. It wasn't like delicious, you know, like I wasn't like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. I also wasn't like, you know, oh, this is, t-. which later on when I started trying more stuff, I would drink teas and be like, this is awful. Like I remember the valerian decoction. 
because I wanted it to be strong. That was <laughs> bad. Bad. Yes. I, I drank it before bed, and I remember laying there, you know, trying to go to sleep, and I was just like, oh "My God, how can I possibly go to sleep when my mouth tastes this terrible?" <laughs> to get in, like, brush my teeth and gargle a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't didn't get the great effect of it, but. Um, so this is like the story of Jim as a young herbalist, prior to herbalist even. You, read, you read a book, you hear about about burdock, you decide you're going to go dig up burdock, make a tea. Like that's a very go-getter attitude. Like you weren't like, oh, let me go read 20 other sources or oh, let me like, you know, get this from the store. You were like into it. So my question is, has that, um, I know that's just kind of who you are. I'm wondering, has that ever st uh, steered you wrong? Uh Yes, it has. Like <laughs> but, trying stuff without adequate research, it has steered me wrong a few times. But I don't think like if in what I remember, and I think this would have been like the mid '90s. You know, I'm sort of vague on what year anything happened in my life happened. But um, it was like the mid '90s, and there was like the occasional health food store that would have like a white box of Alveda brand whatever dried herb that you could make. Um, and stuff in capsules. And I don't think that if that would have been my introduction to herbs, that it would have drawn me in. You know, I, I wasn't super into specifically plants uh, at the time, but like I was really into hiking and being outside. And I had this convergence of like living on 30 acres of overgrown farm, you know, when I was in college and finding this herb book and walking past the botanical gardens every day and saw the plant that was growing next to the barn in the botanical gardens and it said burdock and I looked it up in the book and it said it was kind of good for everything. So I thought, you know, I'll dig it up and make stuff with it. I, I also um, chipped actually, unfortunately, outer bark of willow trees and made tea with that because I didn't know inner bark, outer bark back then, you know, but it was it was going around like I remember walking also next to the barn and going, ow, <laughs> like, what, what just happened? Oh, that must be stinging nettle. I'll make tea with that. So it was a lot of stuff. There was a, um, my friend Dave lived with me at the time. And for a while, like every night, like I would make a tea or he would make a tea. And then we would like sit and drink it and try and feel if anything happened. And after things like nettle or burdock, where there wasn't any kind of like immediate profound effect, um, we started getting into like sleeping potions. And we would go to, um, there was the East Lansing Food Co op at the time. And they had probably like Frontier, or Star West, or you know, at that time maybe Blessed Herbs, herbs, and we would get like every single combination of nervines that we can think of, and like try one or try the other, or mix them all together. That's where the Valerian decoction came from. <laughs> you know, trying that stuff out. I love that story that you're just like walking around and getting stung or finding, you know, seeing the plant next to the barn. Like in that way, it's like a very practical, like the plants called to you. Like mm -hmm. it's not a, you know, esoterical. It was like, no, I was, I was out there and there was the plants and they were piquing my curiosity. And then I found this book and voila. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it, like, like I said, it's all still happening. It's all still like nothing. And I think this is the thing that is why a distractible scatterbrain like myself is still so into herbs is because it's never ending. You know, there's no, like, I, I've never gotten close to the point where I'm like, yeah, I kind of figured all that out. You know, <laughs> there's always more plants or there's always more ways of looking at the plants that I know, or there's always like, I've been looking at something in a particular way. And then I just look at it a slightly different way. And I'm like, oh, wow, there's like a whole new way to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a big thing that, that I try and do every year that, that happens when I I revamp my handouts. I try to revamp my handouts every year or two so they're not old and wrong. Is I look and I'm just like, oh, you know, that was only two years ago I wrote that. And, you know, either it's totally wrong. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that's still in there. Or, oh, the way that I said that isn't really like, there's a better way to think about it now. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that um, for someone that generally teaches a lot, like, when you're in classes and you're saying this stuff, every time you say it and students ask questions, like, you know, all the different questions and all the different like fine tunings of the way that I would present a certain idea or concept get tweaked as I go. And then I look back and I'm like, oh, I haven't 
and then keeping the handouts up with that. And the same thing is true of like old recordings that, you know, I might see, or someone might comment like, oh, on YouTube or on your website, you said this. And I'm like, I didn't say that. That's totally wrong. And then I'll look on my website and be like, oh no, I said that. But it's just, I mean, that's good. It's good to find out like that you're still learning and growing and, you know, finding more and more nuance. And so much of herbalism is in, you know, not like the big claims of this does that, or this is that, or this is antibacterial or anti-inflammatory for this reason or that reason. It's finding sort of like the nuance of, you know, oh, this works best like this for this presentation and this kind of person. And that's constantly being, uh, you know, updated based on experience and questions and other people's telling me what worked for them or didn't work for them. I, I find it not having something that that I figured out and, and am right about is really helpful to learning new things. I, I love all of that. And I love that in herbalism, it really is the, the longer you work with the plants and spend time with the plants, the more you know, and it's just impossible. Like you can't just read something about a plant and then be all knowing. It really does take mm -hmm. several decades of deeper and deeper and something I've always valued within the Western herbalism community, as well as other herbal communities out there is that reverence for elders in that they have those decades of experience um, and being able to, to hear that, you know, the things they've learned over the many years. Yeah. Sometimes I think, you know, cause I, I like music a lot and I'm, we all have our different kinds of music that we like. And we might be thinking like, Oh, that band was really great for those two or three albums like back then and then they they kind of lost it and you know that doesn't really happen in herbalism no one's like you know like oh you know back in 2002 and 2003 jim did some really good classes and then he kind of like lost it i don't know what happened you know, he doesn't have it anymore <laughs> i don't want to go to his new classes they're not so good mm -hmm. i wish he would do his old classes again maybe he could do like a tour where he does his old classes and says his old stuff so yeah, I'm happy that's been happening, right? It's my retirement plan to just keep knowing things and hoping that people want to hear. That's a great analogy. I can see how that might happen to the music you like, but that doesn't happen to Tori. <laughs> <Amos. laughs> <Down there. laughs> All right, and we're going to move on. Um, so Jim finds a book, he finds plants, he works with herbs more and more. And we're going to talk about planting today, which is a plant that you kind of like and you've kind I, of thought yeah. about before. I like plantain immensely. I think it's it's like one of the plants that I use the most. And it's um it's a great example of a plant that's often taught as like a beginner plant, which is kind of a weird concept to think that there's like a beginner plant and an advanced plant, you know? Mm -hmm. Um and the reason people say that is because it's really benign, it's really safe, you know. Um I don't really know how you could cause any kind of harm with it. And it works on so many different kinds of things and systems. It doesn't work in everything. But like, if I think about it, and I should say when I'm talking about plantain, and if I was really prepared, I would have brought the banana, the banana looking thing. And I would have made a joke like, look, plantain fruit, but that's not the plantain we're talking about. We're talking about usually what herbalists using common names we call like broadleaf or narrow leaf plantain. And most of the time they would say, narrow leaf plantain is plantago lanceolata or english plantain um, and broadleaf plantain is plantago major except where i live there's two broadleaf plantains there's the non-native plantago major and there's the native plantago regelii and they look almost exactly the same except the regelii has got like a kind of like reddish purple magenta stem going into the root that would be like the easiest way to probably be right that one is the native Plantago regalii and not the non-native Plantago major. And there's a whole bunch of different species of Plantago. Um, and once we get outside of those three, those are the ones that I, I use. I don't know that they're all interchangeable, but I would say the, the narrow leaf and the two broad leaves are pretty much interchangeable. The one thing that I notice is that the broad leaves, they tend to dry better. So if you're drying your plantain to make tea out of, which I highly recommend, the the broadleaf plantain seem to dry like nice and green and crispy and the narrow leaf plantain kind of blackens sort of like if you try to dry a whole leaf of basil and it looks beautiful green and then it looks all black 
you can cut it into little strips sort of like against, against the veins uh, and that will help it dry quicker. You could put it in a dehydrator that will help it dry quicker and black and less. But in general for dried stuff, I use the plant, the broadleaf plantains. And if I'm making tinctures or oils, I'll use any of those three species interchangeably. And it's like mild. It's, you know, it's astringent, but it's only slightly astringent. It's demulcent, but it's only slightly a demulcent. It's, you know, I would say cooling in nature. And is it moistening or drying? I would say it's moistening and toning, not so much drying. Old Persian medicine says it's cold and dry, but I would say like cooling, moistening, toning, as in like restoring tone to tissues. And you could you could make it in all the ways. So like you can chew on it, you put it in your mouth and you just chew on it and suck the juices. That's a great way to use herbs that people never seem to talk about. Um, you can eat it as a food. It's just kind of green tasting. Um, you could make teas with it. You could make compresses with it. You can crush it up and make poultices with it. You can chew it up and make poultices with it. You can um, make teas with it and soak your foot in it as a soak. Um, you could make teas and drink the teas. You could make tincture with it. You can make oils with it. You can make salves with it. You can make vinegars. All the different ways you can make stuff. You can make stuff with plantain and it works pretty good. And which one works best? I don't think there's one that works best. I would say like make it all the ways and try it out all the different ways and see what works best for you and, and also what you like best, you know, like, oh, you know, I really like the tea. I've read people, um, even the eclectics who I like, some of the eclectics, and I think it might be in King's American Dispensatory, it says that the dried herb doesn't work. That's just wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't normally say things are wrong because, you know, that seems kind of condescending, but that's just wrong. The dried herb definitely works. And for such a common herb, it's really in a lot of ways underutilized. So I remember a few years ago, I was just like looking through commercial tea blends that you could get for various respiratory or digestive or urinary issues. And almost none of them had plantain in them. And a lot of times when people think of the, the type of herb that plantain is, which in Western herbalism we would call a vulnerary or a wound healer, or I think a, a better way to wrap your head around it is to consider it a tissue healer. You know, anywhere there's tissues that are irritated or injured or damaged or inflamed or in some cases infected, plantain usually helps, you know? So it, it covers like most of the bases across, you know, the topically you could use that and that includes stuff like eye washes or like you could put it in the midi pot pour it through your nose that works good it's just always have one of these around one time i was in a thrift store and i saw one of these hanging on the the, the shelf with all the gravy boats <laughs> they must be so frustrated by this little hole that they have um i wish i would have took a picture but i didn't um you can use it for um, topical issues. Um, it's really great for a lot of upper and lower respiratory issues. It's great for digestive issues. It's great for um, urinary issues. It's got anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial properties. So it's good for different applications of immune system issues. Um, probably not so much for like cardiovascular issues, at least that I can wrap my head around. Not so much for endocrine issues as far as I'm aware. I don't really use it a lot for like musculoskeletal issues other than if you hurt yourself and you have like an open wound you could you know use it topically in some kind of way not so much for nervous system issues except you know um plantain is considered a drawing agent and i have occasionally kind of esoterically non-tangentially said like if you got stuff in you that's causing you mental or emotional turmoil, you know, one of the things you can do is like use plantain to help to sort of like draw it out of you, you know, chew on it, carry some on your body, you know, rub some tinctures on your wrist or over your heart or on your third eye. Maybe your third eye is here, could be there. Uh, we don't know where our third eye is. People can have them in different places. But in general, like if I thought about it, like as a nerving or for like physical nerve issues, I don't think about it too much, but especially like anything affecting the skin or the mucous membranes in the body, plantain, like it's just always helpful. It always helps with inflammation. It helps with 
many different kinds of infections, but obviously not all of them. And it's a vulnerable, it's a tissue healer. It really helps to heal the tissues. And it can be used for simple things like mosquito bites or bee stings, or it can be used as a part of like a more nuanced formula for like something that we would consider like super complex, like leaky gut syndrome, you know, or like hyperpermeable gut tissue. We might say it that way too. Uh, and it just tastes kind of green and it's easy to add into tea. It mixes well with lots of different herbs and it's outside where a lot of people live just growing without, you know, you don't need to do anything to cultivate it or to care for it. It just grows and you pick a leaf and you come back. You can use it all throughout the year. You pick a leaf and you come back and it grows more leaves and you pick some more leaves and it grows more leaves. It's really like one of, it's totally sustainable. It's a great plant to use. It's got everything going for it. Wow, that was like a whirlwind of so many uses of plantain. It, it's almost like you could teach like a three-hour class just on plantain. Yeah. I've kind of done that. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's been three hours. Not three hours. Maybe in 2023 or something. Then it'll be 20, 20, with your, the revamped, your revamped class. The revamped class. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you have any specific stories of a time that you've turned to plantain for a specific issue and just go ahead and put you on the spot. Yeah. Here's a few. So we think about plantain as a drawing agent, right? And what does that really mean? Because it sounds kind of nebulous. It sounds like one of these weird things that herbalists think exists that doesn't have any kind of rational thing. But if you get stung by something or bit by something and you crush up or you chew up some plantain and then put it where you got stung or bit. Um, it seems to like pull out the venom or pull out the inflammation. You can put it on splinters. It'll help to pull out splinters. I believe it's Emily Ruff who told the story about how she had got in a car accident and had glass embedded in her palm and she started doing uh, plantain poultices long after it had healed over and it started pulling the glass out. Um, but one time I had swept up a bunch of like the sanded dust of drywall and you know, you're like sweeping it up or trying to vacuum it up and it gets all up in the air. And so you breathe it in and it comes into contact with your moist respiratory tissue. And then it just sticks there because mm -hmm. it's dry and it sucks moisture into it and then creates kind of a film. And so like, you know, after I spent the day and I, I had like, a bandana on or something. After I spent the day um, doing that, I had this terrible dry cough and like I would occasionally get something up. It's mostly non-productive and I could see like white stuff in there. And I was like, oh, I need something to pull this out. And I think I made a blend that had like just plantain and mullein in it and then took that frequently as a tincture. And um, plantain being a little bit demulcent, is really good for dry coughs more so than if you had a really damp cough and i feel like what it does is it causes the lung tissue to moisten more which loosens the stuff that's dried onto it whether that's mucus or in this case drywall dust and one of the things that will happen that can confuse people is that you'll start coughing more because you're actually loosening the stuff up and getting it out of you. And it's easy to misinterpret that. It's like, oh wait, now I'm coughing more and my cough is getting worse. But really, if you think about it, what's happening is you're going from an unproductive dry cough to a more productive cough where you're actually expectorating and getting the stuff out of your lungs that you need to get out of your lungs. So that's worked really well. And I've used that for other people, whether they're, they get you know respiratory issues from drywall dust which is really common or you go in your basement you sweep it all up and you stir up all the dust or you're cleaning up your garage or something or if you work on a roadside doing construction and cars are driving by and there's all kinds of fine airborne particulate matter um it helps with a lot of pollen-based allergies any kind of like fine inhaled airborne particulate matter that's causing dry respiratory issues is really helps with yeah, I would definitely add wildfire smoke to that one, which is something I experience out here oh, yeah. more than you do in the Great Lakes area. But that one, that combo that you mentioned, the plantain mullein is like my go-to. I often add a couple other things to mm -hmm. it some for taste too, but that is an amazing yeah. combination for when you're just, you know, weeks and weeks of breathing in that smoke. It's a nice way to protect the lungs and get some relief. 
Yeah, and it's so simple, you know, they're like common, incredibly sustainable stuff. And, you know, I think sometimes, you know, when I talked about plantain, people think about it as a beginner's herb. They're like, oh, it's a beginner's herb. And because it's a beginner's herb, you use it for simple stuff, which is true. But like, usually a lot of the causative factors of more complex things are kind of simple. So another plantain mullen story, and this was like plantain mullen marshmallow as a tea. I was like a little baby herbalist. No, I was maybe like this big, right? Started off this big, I, maybe this big, right? I was, I was not the herbalist I am now. And um, a friend referred me to someone who was really sick with lupus, you know, and it was sort of like the internet existed, but you know, only so, so it wasn't really easy to like look up lupus and what does everyone do for, for lupus. And I just knew some, some vague stuff about it. And I got to the person's house because I lived in an apartment. I was doing like house calls and all that at the time. And this guy was so sick. His lung function was down to like 14%. You know, and I remember like thinking in my head and I'm trying to be all poker face. I'm like, I am out of my league, like crap. And I just checked myself and I thought like, oh, but wait. And there's this saying that came into my head at that moment that I've, I've kept in my mind all the time, which is just because you can't do everything doesn't mean you can't do anything. And I'm like, what's going on here? He has an inflammatory autoimmune disease and his lung tissue has been inflamed for a really long time and heat dries out fluids and he's having a hard time breathing because his lungs are inflamed and super really dry. And without thinking I'm going to do the thing that cures his lupus, which is a little bit grandiose. I don't even think like that now, but, um, I was like, you know, what, what makes sense to do here? And I was like, well, if we made a tea out of like mullen and plantain and marshmallow, and he drank that, that's a good respiratory demulcent. And within days, it made a huge difference. You know, he went from not being able to like walk to his mailbox because his respiration was so inhibited by how inflamed and dry and tight his lungs were to being able to get up and move around a lot more effectively. And he used that for a period of time. And then it was sort of like that sort of gateway into like, oh, wow, this really simple thing that I did has helped more than, you know, anything else that I've tried or anything else that anyone has offered me. What else could I be doing? Um, so it's like plantain is simple for simple things and it's simple for complex things because complex things always have some simple factors that we can look at and, you know, recognize a pattern and say, what can I do to fix that pattern? I love that story. Cause even though you're like baby herbalist there, yeah, you, that you know, like what is so brilliant about your teachings and something that I've just loved learning from you again and again and again, is that it wasn't that plantain is for lupus. It's that you thought about it critically and thought about tissue state and thought about things energetically which to me is the most exciting and fun thing when we're thinking about matching herbs to people is really looking at those energetic things rather than like mixing and matching herbs for X, Y, Z problem, like, a you know, herbs for fibromyalgia or herbs for back pain. Mm -hmm. It really is thinking about that. And I just, you know, for if, if listeners out there have not yet studied with Jim, that really is the thing that he has honed and presents. And it is like a, just, for me, like I didn't grow up thinking about that. I mean, I grew up thinking about like, you have a headache, take this pill. You have this problem, you take this pill. So mm -hmm. being able to switch our mindset and think about that in a different way really does open up the world of herbalism because in that moment, like you were able to give him something that brought such profound relief more than for this. It's, uh, you know, it's interesting because like I, if I think about what kind of herbalist I am, I'm primarily like an energetic folk herbalist. You know, if I had to describe what I do, that's the best way. And um, you know, for, for, for a brief moment, I was like, oh, I'm talking about plantain. Maybe I should like learn or know some new stuff about plantain. It's like, you know, I, I did a couple searches and it was like, you know, 
methanolic extracts of plantain have, you know, such and such actions on like such and such bacteria, you know, in the Petri dish and, you know, it was all these citations. And I was like, I don't want to dismiss the value of people who perceive herbalism like that, right? Because I'm happy that they can do it because I don't do it very well. But I, I listen to a lot of that and I'm like, you know, that doesn't make as much sense to me. And there's a lot of times that I look at things that have happened to myself that have been very complicated or things that are happening with other people that are really complicated. And I was like, oh, wait, there's there's something simple that people are missing. There was um, someone was had cancer and I don't really work with cancer. I feel like you need someone who like really knows cancer to work with cancer. But I have a few friends that do that. And sometimes like, you know, I share clients with them and one person was asking me like, oh, I wanted, I got this formula. I just wanted your like insight on it. And I was like, oh, I would put some marshmallow in there. And they were like, oh, I didn't know marshmallow had any kind of like anti-cancer properties. And I was like, well, I don't know that it does, but like everything in there is really dry, right? It's like everything in there is really dry. Um, the therapies that the conventional therapies that they use for cancer are really drying. And so it's not about like the cancer. It's about like, oh, are their tissues going to be all dried out and irritated? And whatever the cause, whatever the reason is, no one wants to have dry, irritated tissues. So let's use something that's demulcent, you know, and plantain would work there as well. You know. mm -hmm. I wanted to share a story of uh, last summer, I was in my garden and I got bit by a horsefly three times um, on my same arm, which I don't know if everyone has experienced this before, but it's very painful. And I had three huge red welts on my arm and that were very painful. And so I had plantain everywhere and I was like, I'm going to do an experiment. And so I put the plantain on one of them and sat down, enjoyed the garden. I was doing a plantain poultice. So I just chewed it up and got it all juicy, slapped it on there and had it there for 20 minutes, took it off. And it was like that one was like gone and the other two were flaming red. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. And I stood at it, looked at it for a while and was just like, wow, it's cool. I told my husband, Xavier, look at it. It's so cool. Plantain works. <laughs> um, and then I was like, then after a moment, I was like, oh, I should put on the other ones too. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, I it doesn't have to be like a long-term experiment. But Yeah. I mean, there's really uh, like, what else could you put on bites that, you know, like, like outside of other plants, right? What else can you put on bites and stings that works? Well, that's well what was kind of my, you know, I feel that over and over and over again, herbal as an herbalist, like, what do people do who don't know about plantain? And how uh, much are people suffering needlessly when this needlessly. plant grows all around them and could help, um, you know, like you said, if it's for a horsefly bite or some other kind of venomous uh, sting or, uh, you know, these more complex things that could really be helpful as well. I want to figure out like all the different kinds of stings. And so like spider bites, although a lot of things people say are spider bites aren't spider bites. They're like little localized MRSA infections, right? So a lot of people think like, oh my gosh, I was sleeping and a spider came and crawled into my bed and bit me. Eh, probably not, but sometimes spiders do bite you. Mosquito bites, horse fly bites. It's only so, so on chiggers, like chigger bites, chigger mm -hmm. bites. Are, oh God, they're horrible. It won't, prevent Lyme disease, but it's a good idea to use like after a tick bite, you take the tick bite off and put some plantain on there and maybe wet it with some echinacea tincture. If you need to increase the anti-inflammatory or antihistamine action, you can add a little bit of ragweed teacher, uh, teacher, tincture, um, or a little bit of peach leaf uh, tincture uh, along with the plantain and that can work good. There's a lot of help, but a friend of mine once was down in Florida and they're like, I got stung by a stingray. And I was like, oh, can you find some plantain? <laughs> like, I don't know if it grows around here. And I was like, don't do anything until you can find some plantain. And they're like, why wouldn't I do anything until I can find some plantain if I don't see any plantain around here? I'm like, because I want to know if plantain works for stingray <laughs> things. Something tells me that they maybe weren't as dedicated no, they, to they, out as you were. If it were me, I would have been like, I will suffer with this until I find plantain. Um, maybe not. And I, you know, we don't have scorpions here, so I haven't tried it for scorpion stings. Uh, but you know, audience, <laughs> please <laughs> try it yeah, out. Let please me write in with your sting your, stories. Your, your plantain stings. testimonials are always welcome. 
Well, for those of you who would like even more about plantain, Jim has shared a handout with us and you can download your free plantain handout when you visit the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. Just recently updated. Recently updated, recently Just revamped. Updated. Yeah, I thought I'm going to send you something. I was like, oh, I got to look over this, make sure it's still good. <laughs> well, is there, do we leave out anything about plantain? Is there anything you'd like to make sure we cover? Uh, I think that one of the things that plantain really excels at, it works great as a chew. So you just like grab some leaves, you give it a couple of chews and you stick it in your cheek. And that works good for all kinds of ulcerations. It works good for like canker sores or stomatitis. You know, it can work for cold sores on your lips if you sort of like chew it and then drool out over where the cold sore is at. It works good for like sore and swollen thirts, uh, throats and, um, and sore tonsils, um, uvular prolapse or swelling, which is a thing that happens. And you can, I think that it, like chewed plantain works all the way up to the lower esophageal sphincter. And what's so nice about it is that if you, you know, you make tea of it and you drink it, and then eventually you run out of tea and you're not drinking it. Um, or you take the tincture and then you can take the tincture again and again. But if you just keep plantain like is a chew in your cheek every single time it's constantly infusing your saliva and every single time that you swallow those tissues are being bathed with like plantain virtues um it's a great it's just a great way to use herbs i think that chewing herbs is like highly underappreciated and if you look in most of the herbal preparations book you know they don't have a section of like these herbs make great chews um, and so I would, I would encourage using plantain like that, really easy to do, uh, very accessible, um, you know, throughout most of the year when it's green and lush. It kind of sounds like another handout we could use from you um, or a class, you know, it's like the, the world of herbal chews. Stuff I've chewed. I know you practice what you preach. I've seen you walk around chewing all sorts of plants all the time. So this is, you may be one of the most experienced herbalists out there when it comes to herbal chews. So someone when i was teaching a, a, a walk on plantain and i said you know you can chew it up which is my for a poultice and that's sort of what i prefer i think it works a little bit better but if you don't want to chew it you can just like crush it up in your hands until it's juicy and a student in the class is like is there a time that you would prefer to crush it up rather than chew it up and i was like if you just got stung and the plantain that's growing is by a fire hydrant in a place where you know a lot of people walk their dogs, you probably just want to crush that up. Good call. <laughs> Pour some water over it beforehand, right? That would be a good example of when you would want to like not chew the, if you chew the plantain and you're like, this is kind of acidic and a little bit salty. <laughs> just stop thinking about it. And you're like, done is right. done. I'm just going to poultice it on there. But the it's next leaf. Sterile. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for sharing all this wisdom about plantain with us. And I am sure that there are many people wondering about how they could learn more with you. And uh, I'm curious what projects you have going on. What classes are you teaching soon? Um, hopefully bunches, because I really want to get back to teaching lots. Um, it's almost like the whole world's been like shut down, kind of. <laughs> um, so things that are coming up, uh, depending on when this comes out. I'm starting to do, th so my website is herbcraft.org or herbcraft.podia.com and podia is P-O-D-I-A.com. So herbcraft.podia.com. That's all of like the online classes and stuff that you can buy. Um, there's also free stuff you can watch on YouTube. If you type in Jim McDonald and Herbalist, there's free YouTube stuff you can watch. You have some really fabulously edited videos on YouTube. Yeah, sure. Aren't there? Yeah, I had this really spectacular woman do that. There is my website also has a ton of free information. But if you wanted to like help me out and help me like pay car insurance for my oldest son, <laughs> I've got a bunch of classes you can do. Um, coming up, depending on coming up or happen happening, depending on when this airs, um, I'm doing some live like open ended like ask me questions. Which will just oh, be I'm so excited for this. Yeah, just, you know, just I'm going to be there and, and ask me stuff. And that way, like, 
one of the things that I miss about like have having a lot of classes is the questions that people ask me. And, you know, like online stuff is really cool, but I've always had like a lot of back and forth dialogue and like the thing that's exciting for me is not like I prepared this great class and now I'm going to present it to you. And it's kind of like this direction, but it's like, oh, I'm going to pitch out like the stuff that I think and the stuff that I wonder about and like where I'm at in that wondering. And as I do it, people say like, you know, oh, well, what about this? Or, oh, I had this experience. Um, or, oh, you know, do you think that this, this would apply to that? And I really enjoy thinking about that, you know, like playing with those ideas and like, you know, thinking like, oh, I thought the way that I was explaining this worked really great, but maybe it didn't. So I'll try to think on the spot of a new thing, um, a new way to explain something or like, you know, just just having that that interaction. I think that every, a lot of people, because we've been locked down because there's a crazy virus around, are missing a lot of the back and forth interaction. And so I'm looking forward to doing that. And then um, both live and in person here and also online, I have my my um, April through October Lindera Herbal Intensive course, which is where we look at our energetic model, um, you know, that we're talking about in terms of like recognizing patterns of hot and cold and dry and damp and tense and lax. And what does that look like in people and what kind of herbs balance that out? And then um, after we look at our model, rather than being like, oh, we covered energetics, let's move on to the next thing. We take that model and then we apply it to one system and then another system and then another system and then another system. And then we talk about a bunch of different plants using that model. And that's like my favorite thing that I do all year because it's the most like cohesive put together um, way that I can be, you know, super long winded and, you know, uh, talk about energetics. And it's, it's not so much a, like an introduction to herbalism course. It's a, you know, um, yes, there's a lot of information. There's tons of like tidbits of information, but the real thing that I'm wanting out of it is to sort of like convey that there's this way of thinking that makes using herbs easier and often gets you better results using herbs. And what I'm hoping to convey is that you can learn that way of thinking and adapt it to your practice in whatever way works best for you, you know? So it's like, it's not like the the, the Jim McDonald method, and this is the way it is, and everyone's supposed to do it the same. It's like, you know, I learned this from this person and this person and this person, and I put it together like this, and then I can be one of the people that you might learn it from, and then you might put it together differently in a way that works for you, but sort of like learning to recognize how these energetic imbalances present and what they look like. And just again, you know, sort of like what makes common sense, you know, like, oh, there's dry tissues there. They need to be moistened. I need a demulcent. Which demulcent is the right demulcent to use? You know, is it corn silk? Is it marshmallow? Is it plantain? Oh, the tissues are irritated and inflamed and slightly damaged and maybe hyperpermeable. It's probably plantain. So that kind of thinking is it's where it's at. And then I hope, um, spring, summer, fall to be doing lots of walks and getting people outside to look at plants and, you know, uh, see them growing in the ground because that's always like the best place to be to talk about them. Yeah, studying with you is it's so much fun and it's so insightful and I, I can't recommend it more highly. Uh, I've spent many hours of class with you myself and I'm looking forward to the opportunity again as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'll let you come back. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, so the last question is one I'm asking everybody in season three, and you already kind of alluded to it already, but I'm asking this question because I believe that whether someone's been working with plants for a week or for two decades or for six decades, there's still something new uh, mm -hmm. out there. And so my question to you is, what's something new that you're learning or that you're trying or just something new you're finding with plants these days? Hmm, so many things. Um, how to pick, let me, let me think of, of one. So there's a, um, a non-native, slightly invasive shrub that goes around, uh, grows around this area called burning bush. It's what, Unanimous uh, alatus. Um, and it's got these cool little on the stems, these little winged stems on it. And they use it in Chinese medicine. I, I would only slaughter the Chinese name for it. So I'm not going to say that, but 
one of the translations of it is the winged arrow that kills demons. And, you know, I was like, I just, I just want to use that. And I don't, um, you know, I'm like a Western herbalist and I get Western herbalism. And there are some Western herbalists who are really good with like Western herbalism and Chinese medicine and Ayurveda or and this and, and that. And I mostly just do Western herbalism. But if a plant from, you know, another tradition grows in my area, and especially if it's non-native, and even more especially if it's kind of like aggressive or invasive, I want to think like, oh, is there some way that I can utilize this plant? And the winged arrow that kills demons, can you get better than that? And what that relates to is this concept in Chinese medicine called Gu syndrome, syndrome, where like they said, like, basically, like, you have a kind of sickness that's sort of like a demonic possession related to some kind of, of like parasite or infection. And my my mind and my imagination just explodes with that. And I think about like, oh, like Lyme disease or like long COVID or like these things where people get sick. And then the sickness really doesn't just like derange their mucosa or affect this or affect that. It sort of gets into all the different kind of facets of their life and sort of like takes over and possesses their life and becomes this all consuming thing. And so um, the last couple of years, what I've been doing is I've been going around and thinking, you know, even though something is, so even though something is non-native and even though it's aggressive and even though it's invasive, I'm still not just gonna go in and like chop it all down. That just doesn't seem respectful to plants to me. So I've been going around and being like, oh, where can I find a bunch of this? I can trim off some stems and um, I hope to start like playing around with it, making different kinds of potions and, you know, giving it to, um, Probably when I'm doing something that to me, and not to another tradition of medicine, but to me is kind of experimental, I'll look for like old students or old clients who I know and have a relationship so that I can say to them, like, I have no idea if this is going to work. Do you want to try something? Do you want to be a part of an experiment? Because if if a client were just coming to me and they're like, I'm really sick and I feel terrible. And I was like, oh, I have this protocol that works really well for a lot of people. But there's this other thing that I want to try that I've never tried before and I don't know if it's going to work. Do you want to do that? You know, they're probably not going to jump on that as the option unless they're an herbalist, you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'll try that. So I'm kind of excited to try that. I'm, I really hope that um, I miss I miss conferences. I miss going and spending time with a bunch of other herbalists who like think different things than I do or think the same things that I do in different ways. And, you know, you know, there's always the classes, but I think the at conferences that I miss the most is all the interstitial time where like conversations and you know break out and it's like between classes or over lunch or after the conference is over and people playing Jenga with their feet you know um that's like so a, a lot of stuff that I've taken home from conferences have has been from those interstitial times and not from like specifically this person said this in a class and I was like got that so I hope that there's a way that that can become, you know, more feasible as a, as a means for, for people to, you know, get more exposure to different ideas uh, and to sort of like break out of just the, the way that they're doing and seeing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I miss conferences too. They're such a formative part of my life and it's kind of a, an odd thing that it's been so long now. So. We, we met at conferences, right? We met at conferences, yeah. We know each other before from online stuff, but we met at conferences, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, there's a bunch of people, like my closest friends, that I can say, like, oh, yeah, I've met them here, met them there, met them there. And people will always ask me sometimes, um, they'd be like, well, what's the best conference? And um, the, the, pr the pertinent thing to say is the Great Lakes Herb Fair, because I have to run it. But, Honestly, like it's usually the one that I'm at at the moment, you know, mm -hmm. they've all got their kind of different flavor and their different flair. Um, definitely some are more organized than others, but um, it's really just, you get around, you know, different groups of people. And if you have a whole bunch of people that are excited about plants, getting together and learning and sharing, like how could you go wrong? <laughs> So true. Well, I look forward to seeing you in person um, this year and beyond, and hopefully it'll be at a conference. 
And thank you so much for being here, Jim. And it's been great to have you. And I'd love to have you on again sometime. So oh, yeah, part two. Part two. Yeah. Part two. Absolutely. That's the second the second hour of three. It can be a trilogy. There we go. Well, thank you so much, Jim. All right. So long, everyone. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Jim's plantain handout. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can also visit Jim directly at herbcraft.podia.com. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so that you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this lovely versatile plant. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.